Welcome to the Reasonable Faith Podcast. I'm Kevin Harris in studio with Dr. Craig, where we're continuing to cover your trip to South Africa, debating and speaking there. Very exciting for Reasonable Faith to be there, as many say that some long-term effects for the truth of the claims of Christ were really put in place, Bill. And another debate that you had while you were there was with Yusuf Ismail, a Muslim. That's right. He is Muslim. There is a small percentage of the South African population which is Muslim, and he is a protege of the infamous South African Muslim apologist Ahmed Didat, who was a real firebrand for Islam in South Africa. And Ismail is a practicing attorney and sometime apologist. He's Mm -hmm. probably the most prominent Muslim apologist in South Africa right now. And so when my hosts invited me to come to South Africa, they thought that having a debate with a Muslim and contrasting the Muslim view with the Christian view would be something that would be a good way of reaching out to Muslims. So this debate was held in a fairly large church in a section of Cape Town that is on the side of the city where there's a good deal of Muslims. There's a large Muslim population. And so the audience that night had several hundred Muslims there, all dressed in different sorts of colorful garb, and as well as hundreds of Christians. There were about a thousand people in all that packed into this hall to hear the debate. And it was funny, Kevin, because as I was speaking and and seeing the Muslims and hearing sometimes them chant and so forth, I I thought to myself, boy, it it really looks like there's a lot of African Muslims here tonight. Then I thought, wait, you are in Africa. (laughs) Where am I? Yeah, exactly. Where am I? And it, it, it really brought it home to me that here I was speaking to African Muslims in their own country. And so it was a real thrill to do that. And the topic of the debate was identifying Jesus. Is he man or both man and God? Right. That topic was the result of a long negotiation. Mr. Ismail wanted to debate on identifying Jesus. Is he man or God? And I thought this is an unacceptable topic because it just plays right into the Muslim misconception of who Jesus is. It's a false dichotomy to say Jesus man or God, because as Christians, we believe that he is fully human or truly human. We believe that he's truly man and truly God. So to set up that false dichotomy, is he man or God, already is buying into a Muslim view where these are mutually exclusive categories. And if you demonstrate the humanity of Jesus, then you've automatically excluded his divinity. And so I didn't want to fall into that trap and insisted that we have a debate on uh, is Jesus human and divine or something of that sort. And this was the wording that finally was acceptable to him. Is he man or both God and man? Good move. Because the most hated debates that you often see on the internet and uh, in public with Muslims on Jesus and they will begin to be very vehement about God has no partners and mm-hmm. there is none other like God. And it is a confusion that God doesn't go to the bathroom and, yes. and you know, and, and things like that. And so that just stirs up this, this yeah. fever. Exactly. For, uh, and, and so they think that if you demonstrate Jesus weakness, his spatially being confined, is being confined in time, his mortality, his ignorance, or even as you say, Kevin, is going to the toilet. Mm -hmm. They think that by demonstrating his true humanity, you have thereby demonstrated that he's not God. Whereas from a Christian point of view, that's just a complete non sequitur because of all those things do is demonstrate his true humanity, which we wholeheartedly accept. Indeed, it's a heresy to deny the true humanity of Christ. That's right. I, you know. Now, did you speak first? Yes. Yes, because, I did go first in this debate. Because I would think, Bill, that this would be an opportunity for you to really kind of lay this out, what you just laid out mm-hmm. for us. Yeah, so yes, tell us what it, you it did. did help me to set the tone for the debate by saying, in order for him to demonstrate that Jesus is not God, He has to do more than demonstrate that Jesus is human, because I agree with that. He needs to show 
that there's no good reason to think that he's divine. And what I need to do for my part is to show that there are good reasons to think that Jesus was not merely human, but also divine. And so it helped to set out exactly where our respective burdens of proof lay, what each of us had to do. My opening case was that Jesus made several indisputably authentic claims that demonstrate his radical divine human self-consciousness. And I appealed here to the parable of the vineyard, where Jesus claims to be the only unique beloved son of God. Secondly, to his saying in Matthew eleven twenty seven 27, about him being the absolute revelation of God the Father and the, the Son of God. And then finally, his saying about being the Son of Man, prophesied by the prophet Daniel. And on the basis of these authentic sayings of Jesus, we can see that Jesus had a radical divine human self-concept. And then I argued that having been crucified for these blasphemous claims, Jesus was then raised from the dead by God and presented the evidence for the resurrection so that his claims were vindicated. Far from being a blasphemer, the resurrection showed that Jesus had spoken the truth. God had publicly and dramatically vindicated these allegedly blasphemous claims. So that was basically my case for the divinity of Christ. What I also did in my opening speech that was kind of interesting was having looked at Mr. Ismail's DVDs and in my pre-debate preparation, I discovered that he pushes the mythological line about Jesus, that the beliefs about Jesus are derived from pagan mythology. Now, what's so odd about this, Kevin, is that these same mythological beliefs would serve to undermine Islam as well, because Islam also affirms that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he really existed when was was a great prophet, that he performed miracles like healing the lame and giving sight to the blind, and that he's coming again at, at the end of history. So, so it was very odd to hear Ismail going on and on and on about all these pagan analogies of the mother and child, mm. the mother goddess with the baby in her arms. And he would talk about how these are in Hinduism and ancient religions from Africa, as well as in Middle Eastern and Greco-Roman religions and so forth. And I thought, well, this, this is bizarre. If he really thinks that the virgin birth is, is mythological, this would undermine Islam because the Quran has the virgin birth story and, and affirms this of Jesus. So in my opening speech, I pointed out that this mythological approach is taken by many secular websites. I didn't identify it with him. I just said in the, in the internet, you'll hear this very often spoken of and that Muslims are rightly offended by these attacks upon Jesus because they repudiate Jesus as he's taught in the Quran as well as in the New Testament. And therefore, we as Christians and Muslims agree with each other in repudiating these scurrilous attacks upon Jesus as being just a mythological figure. And then I explained how this was out of date in the scholarly world, that it's only among popularizers and so forth, and uh, concluded by saying the next time somebody comes to you making these mythological claims, you can therefore know that he's either a charlatan or he's completely ignorant of contemporary scholarship. Well, that just sort of set Mr. Ismail up, as you could imagine. Oh, and yeah. I don't know if he changed his strategy at the last minute or not, but there was scarcely a peep from him in the debate about the mythological Jesus. It only came up very late in the debate when he was desperate and began to talk about how December 25th is the product of oh. pagan mythology even though the New Testament doesn't say Jesus was born on December 25th. <laughs> no. So it, that was kind of a, an advantage of going first in this debate, was being able to frame these issues in advance in this way. Well, these debates, Christian-Muslim debates, can get kind of raucous. Sometimes. Oh, this they one just... did. There were lots, hundreds of Muslims in the audience, and they had come out to cheer for him. Mm -hmm. And although the moderator instructed the audience not to clap or cheer during the speeches, that 
was observed only during the constructive speeches, but when it got to the rebuttals and Ismail began to run out of ammunition, he kind of went off the track and got away from the issues the debate was supposed to be on and started pressing all the hot buttons of the Muslims about Bible contradictions and the two genealogies of Jesus. And really, he was throwing a lot of red meat to the partisans in the crowd. And then they began at these points to cheer and, and yell and shout Arabic slogans and so forth. And he would use things like uh, 1 John 5, 7 is not in the original manuscripts, the one that is the King James Version uh, proof text for the Trinity, mm -hmm. thinking that because this is not in the New Testament, therefore the doctrine of the Trinity has no basis, as though it depended on this one late verse. And uh, the Muslims all cheered and applauded at that. So when I got up in my next speech, I said, you know, you Muslims here tonight who have applauded for these points really ought to be ashamed of yourselves for applauding such vacuous and irrelevant points in the debate tonight. And that just sort of, you know, put them back on their heels a little bit and silenced so, them. I, good for you. I, oh, good I, I you. think in, I, we've learned that in debates with Muslims, they really respect strength rather than conciliatory appeasement. Mm -hmm. they If you disagree with them, but you do so with strength and con conviction, that actually increases your credibility in their eyes. And so just rhetorically, I think it was important to face them down on this and say these points are irrelevant and worthless, and anybody who thinks they are really ought to be embarrassed about that. And so it was a raucous debate because of the partisans in the crowd that were, were there to cheer for Islam. Again, this was an instance of not having arguments or running out of ammunition, and so you go to your little pet rocks and, and then just start throwing them out there. It reminds me of a comedian. Comedians often say when they're doing stand-up that if they're really bombing bad and they don't have the crowd and their, their jokes are starting to not work, they'll go profane. They'll start using oh. a lot of profanity. Huh. And the worse they fail, the worse they bomb, the more profanity they start throwing in. Yeah. And at that point, the club owner knows that it's over. And I'm not saying that he, that Ismail was starting to use profanity. No. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is when you run out of ammunition or you can't answer, then you just start throwing things out. Yeah, um, you resort to now we, the we red Christians, meat or the emotional appeals. We Christians do that too. We got to be careful. I mean, it's usually when we can't answer, but we'll say, "Well, you'll find out in the end." Yeah, there or, you go. Uh, That's well, right. You know, or I'll, I'll see pray you for in the, you. Uh, well, I'll pray for you. <laughs> you know, or, or God bless you. And um, <laughs> we're learning a lot from these debates. We are on um, civility, technique, um, strategy. Yeah. In, yes, in and I have to say, to his credit. He, he never attacked me personally, nor, of course, I him. So although he was pushing the hot buttons and trying to get the crowd to cheer and so forth, he always conducted himself as a gentleman, and I appreciated that. It's been often pointed out to me that the Muslim world looks at American television or American movies and thinks that that's Christianity mm -hmm. because they equate American and Christianity. And we're kind of taking a side trip here. But if they see some profane video on, on MTV, they'll go, that's Christianity? There is that image that fuels that fire that we've got a lot of work to do in that area. Yeah, the image that Hollywood has given to the Muslim world, I think, has done more damage to America and to Christianity than almost anything. I remember a couple of years ago, Jan and I were in Tunisia and one of the Muslim university professors that we had dinner with said, you know what the average Tunisian's image is of an American? I, we said, no, what is it? He says, it would be a guy in a T-shirt with the sleeves rolled up and a cigarette pack in, in the sleeve, a couple of guns on his hips and a McDonald's hamburger in his mouth. <laughs> and that was their image of the average American. They might be right. And <laughs> <laughs> well, I told him I'd never seen anybody ever use a gun yeah. in, in, in crime or in public, never seen anybody pull a gun. They were absolutely amazed. Sure. They well, thought this was like the Wild West. Oh, yeah. They'll get that impression from the media that, that Yes, that and of course, then the yeah. immorality and, and things of that sort that Hollywood purveys. It's no wonder Muslims are offended if they think this is Christianity. I, I would be offended, too. Did he make some points 
as far as did he try to use the Bible or the New Testament to make his points, or did he go to the Quran? You know, about his only substantive attack was to claim that the doctrine of the Incarnation is incoherent logically, that Jesus cannot be both God and man because these two things exclude each other. How can a being have the properties of being both, say, omnipresent and yet spatially located, or being omniscient and yet being ignorant of certain things? And the interesting thing about this, Kevin, was that he was aware of my work on the Incarnation. He had apparently read Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview and the chapter in there on the Incarnation and attempted in some way to interact with it. It wasn't in-depth. It was mainly just expressing incredulity about how this could be. And here I had a really wonderful analogy for the Incarnation that I think would be helpful to share with our listeners. Please. I asked them if any of them had seen the movie Avatar, and a number of them had. And I said, the word Avatar is actually another word for incarnation. That's what an Avatar is. It's an incarnation. And I said, this film actually tells the story of the incarnation of a disabled American Marine named Jake Sully into this world of the Navi, where Sully takes on this body of this Navi and, and becomes incarnate among them as one of them. And what I pointed out was that Jake Sully in this movie is one person with two natures. He has a human nature and he has a Navi nature. And moreover, these two natures have very different properties. For example, in his human nature, he's, he's disabled. He's in a wheelchair. So if you were to ask the question, can Jake Sully run? The answer would have to be, well, yes and no. Yes in his Navi nature, but no in his human nature. And yet he has both of these properties simultaneously. So I said, if you can understand Avatar, the movie, you can understand the incarnation of Christ. Christ is one person with two natures, with very different properties. Boy, movies make great conversation starters, don't they? Yeah. Now, are we to understand Jesus limited his rights to his divine nature? You can't limit the divine nature, but he, he limited his access or his, or his abilities in that area in order to take on the form of a servant. Yeah, it would be my, my inclination would be to say that Jesus did not choose to access all of the powers that were available to him. So, for example, even though he could have repulsed all the Roman soldiers with just a wave of his hand, nevertheless, he chose not to use his power that was available to him in his divine nature, but he chose to limit himself to those powers that his human nature possessed. And similarly, with regard to his omniscience, I think it's helpful to distinguish in a theologically significant way between Jesus' subconscious and his conscious life. In his conscious life, I think Jesus limited himself to what a human being could know at that time and place in history. And that's why the Bible says he grew in wisdom and in knowledge mm -hmm. as he grew from being a boy to being a man. But in his subconscious life, in his subconscious mind, there I think the full range of divine omniscience lay beneath the surface. Uh, but Jesus did not access that typically during his, what theologians call the state of humiliation, that is the, the time of the incarnation up to the time of his death and burial. He, he humbled himself. He humbled he, himself. That's he, exactly he, right. He condescended. As we wrap up today, Bill, this is a real sticking point between Muslims and Christians, and it can be so emotional. I mean, it's the, the sin of shirk in mm -hmm. the Muslim world to attribute any companions uh, are any equal to God. And so they have a real resistance to any thought that Jesus was God. Part of it will be understanding and be able to articulate the two doctrines of the Trinity and of the Incarnation. Because I think when you have a proper understanding of the Trinity and the Incarnation, you can see that we are not committing the sin of shirk, of associating something with God. 
Rather, we're saying that Jesus is God. Mm -hmm. So it's not a matter of saying that God has some sort of a peer or that there's something else that's comparable to God that we're associating with God. We're saying that Jesus is God. He is one of the three persons of the Godhead, of the Trinity that God is. Mm -hmm. And so this charge of shirk or association simply falls to the ground once you understand these doctrines properly. And it seems that often our Muslim friends are kind of on the horns of a dilemma because the Quran says that Jesus is of God, and yet if he's of God, then we need to look at his claims and we need to look at records written of him yep. and look at his words and look at eyewitness testimony about him and find out what his claims are, this man of God. This exactly. man who came from God. This, this was a point that I tried to make during the debate. I said to the audience, those of you who are Muslims here really find yourself in a dilemma because you believe that Jesus was a great prophet. And therefore, what he said is true. You have to believe what Jesus said as a Muslim. And yet tonight I've shown that he said that he was the unique son of God, the divine human son of man and so on, and Mr. Ismail hasn't been able to dispute the authenticity of those claims by Jesus. Therefore, you've got to believe what he said, and therefore should believe in, in Christ. Well, thank you so much for joining us for Reasonable Faith, and we have some great podcasts ahead and planned for you. So come back often to reasonablefaith.org. And if you want to be a part of us, be sure that you look for the many opportunities in your own area to start a Reasonable Faith chapter. And you can also partner with us financially by donating to Reasonable Faith as we continue to expand all over the world. Thank you so much for partnering with us. And just go to reasonablefaith.org for our resources and for other ways to become a part of us. That's reasonablefaith.org. And we'll see you next time on Reasonable Faith.